Have you ever come across a scientific study and thought, can I really trust this? So many of us rely on research to make decisions about our health, politics and lifestyle, but without the right tools, it's almost impossible to know which studies are solid and which are junk. That's where this video comes in. And this is part two of five in my series, which unpacks a single book that builds your critical thinking skills. And today's focus is how to read a paper by Trish Greenhow, a book that does exactly what it says on the cover. If you've ever felt overwhelmed by research and wish you knew how to cut through the noise, this video will give you the exact questions and methods that experts use to evaluate evidence. I'm Zach, a hospital doctor from Scotland, and as someone who frequently needs to look at scientific research, I can tell you that this book is one of the most practical guides out there for spotting good science from bad. Let's dive in. Trisha Greenhall is a public health professor in her job has to assess different types of evidence and decide whether it's worth reading or not. Now the book gives you a brief overview of how to find scientific evidence, but it spends most of its time talking about how to trash it. Trisha suggests that we ask three main questions of any research paper. One, why was the research question needed? Because there's no point reading it otherwise. Second, what was the research design? Now to answer that question, you need to know a little bit about the different types of research study. So from most reliable to least reliable, you have systematic reviews and meta-analyses at the top, then you have randomized control studies, then you have cohort studies where scientists follow people along uh, for a long period of time to see what happens to them depending on whether they've been exposed to the agent of interest or not. There's case control studies, which are like cohort studies, but they're less good in that you're trying to rely on people remembering what they were exposed to a long time ago in the past. Then you have cross-sectional surveys or observational studies, which basically say, oh, we found something, but doesn't tell you what the cause is because it's not experimental. And lastly, you have case reports, which is just when somebody decides to report something in the literature without any controls it can be useful in terms of rare phenomena but it's not something that you would want to rely upon in any other circumstance and the third question is was that design appropriate an inappropriate study might be using observational data to infer causation and Likewise, if you're doing a randomized control study or a meta-analysis, that might not be the right way to go about studying something that is really, really rare. So you might ask, okay, so I've asked these three basic questions. Now, how do I know that it's telling me the truth? So here's Trisha's advice on how to assess the quality of a paper in depth. First, you have to know who was studied and how did they find them? Now, she also says that we should ask not just who was studied, but how they were recruited. Is there gonna be bias in there? So for a long time, medical studies have been really hampered by the fact that it has been young males that have been recruited for the studies. This is the subject of Caroline Criado Perez's book, Invisible Woman, in which she laments the fact that so much medical research has never been done on women. And so that puts doctors like me in a really hard position when we're trying to give women set, uh, scientific medical advice. We just don't have as much of an evidence base on which to advise them. Secondly, we ask what was being studied and what was the comparison? You might think this is very simple, that there should just be a control that is exactly the same. But here's how this can get complicated. Now, you may have heard that alcohol in moderate amounts is healthy, but that is all based on studies that have got people to say whether they are drinking now or not. And the problem with that is that you can get people who say that they're not drinking now that have actually given up alcohol because they've been an alcoholic or that they're teetotal for other reasons. And this means that their health outcomes are worse when you try to measure them. That gives us another way of seeing this J-shaped curve. It might be that actually zero alcohol is the healthiest thing, but we wouldn't know because the previous studies were not actually designed in a way that eliminated this risk of there being 
unhealthy ex-drinkers counted as people who didn't drink. Another reason that you have to be careful with what's being studied and how it's being measured is to do with proxy measures. So a proxy measure is where, it, let's say you're interested in studying smoking habits, but you don't actually ask people what their smoking habits are. You just go off their GP records. That's a proxy measure because it might not be accurate. It's not the exact thing that you're looking for, but it's a good enough measure that you might be able to say something useful. So pharmaceutical companies really like proxy measures because they're easy, they're less costly, and they give the impression that something is being done. But with proxy measures, we don't always know that it's an actually important finding. An example would be studying renal disease by looking at protein levels in the urine. They might show that a drug really reduces the protein levels in the urine, but actually, does that make a difference with the disease or not? Well, who knows, because that's not what the study has been set up to do. Then there's a whole bunch of questions to ask about how the study was analysed. Was the study double blind? Or were researchers able to guess who was in the treatment group and who was uh, not? And have that influence their answers? Was the study hypothesis driven? Did the scientists actually start out with a hypothesis of interest that they went to find out the data for? Or did they just put some numbers into a big database and see what came out, looking for patterns that might actually only be there by chance? That's a bad enough error to make the scientific paper worthless. Lastly, did they do their statistics right? Patricia tells us that we don't actually need to be good at maths or be statisticians. All we need to look at is, was the study adequately powered with a big enough sample size to detect the difference that they were looking for? If they're detecting a very small effect size, then they need a bigger sample. The other thing that can happen with studies is that people drop out. And instead of looking at who dropped out, those people get taken out of the analysis. When that happens, you're basically ignoring something that might be really important in the study findings. So if you see that in a paper, you should ignore that paper. Finally, Trisha gives us some special cases to think about. She has specific questions for all of the different types of studies, which you should definitely go and look at. But I'm gonna pull out just two things. Firstly, there's a lot about the different tricks that Big Pharma will use to make something look better than it actually is. Pharmaceutical sales reps might meet with doctors armed with advertising material about medical celebrity endorsements, misleading graphs, and theoretical arguments that don't have any evidence to back them up. That's something which people should be really aware of. The second important lesson is to do with sensitivity analysis. So this is where you get a positive finding for your study. You think something is going on, but actually if you just change the variables just a little bit, you might get a completely different answer. Trisha shows how this can happen very easily in science by a joke paper that looked at dice therapy in strokes. The idea was that they would treat patients depending on whether they used red dice, white dice, or green dice in order to randomize them to a particular treatment group. Now, all of the trials showed that it was useless. But what they then did was they published a meta-analysis which showed that the red dice had a really significant impact. How had this happened? What they did was show how just a few changes to some of the variables. For example, they excluded some negative results uh, that seemed to be out keeping with the rest of the data. And they decided that some papers that hadn't been included in the systematic review should have been accepted rather than rejected because they were treading a fine line. And it got them to a completely different answer. So if you see a sensitivity analysis in a scientific paper, you can be a little bit more confident that it's robust. Now, why do I think this book is important? It's important because evidence behind our beliefs matters, but in this day and age, very few people take the time to actually understand how the evidence is generated and what the flaws in it might be. As Trisha herself says, it usually comes as a surprise to students to learn that some published articles, the purists would say up to 99%, belong in the bin and certainly should not be used to inform practice. Unfortunately, lots of science ends up as junk, and it's junk that can be used by somebody to say, oh, this is absolutely crystal clear. 
when it's not. A lot of good things have come out about the hydroxy. A lot of good things have come out. White House doctor recommend that you take that? Is that why you're taking it? Yeah, White House doctor. I didn't recommend. No, I asked him, what do you think? He said, well, if you'd like it. I said, yeah, I'd like it. I'd like to take it. A lot of people are taking it. A lot of frontline workers are taking hydroxychloroquine. Where evidence passes these tests, it's a good paper that we should rely on. But if it doesn't, we should discard it. But then you might ask, Critical thinking is not just about logic and data. What about the complex, creative and emotional layers of how we think? In the next video, we'll be exploring Hypersanity by Dr. Neil Burton, a psychiatrist who shows us that true clarity of thought requires expanding our thinking to include emotion, meaning and creativity. You'll find the link here once it's ready. And if you're grappling with the frustration of misleading headlines and sensationalist news, check out this one instead. I'll see you in the next video.